Welcome back to Epic Rides and part two of this Canada Day special. This episode, we're going to check out the rest of my adventures in Lac de Bonnie over the Canada Day long weekend. If you haven't watched part one yet, there's a link in the description below as well as up here on the screen. recap from last episode. I decided to make a route from my home in Winnipeg up to Lac de Bonnie to spend the weekend taking in all the festivities over the long weekend. I visited the fair, the museum, Blueberry Rock Trail, and I took in the fireworks. It was awesome. Surrounded by poison ivy, attacked by mosquitoes, being swarmed. It's a beautiful place for a visit. You should come. <laughs> ah! <laughs> Look at Play the poison ivy. Could have dragging me through. Today I'm gonna go check out the farmers market, the car show, a talent show, and old Pinawa Dam before heading back to Winnipeg. After a terrifying ride back to Beauzeger, to the Superior Inn, due to suicidal deer as well as several close calls, I didn't think I was going to sleep, as I was still ramped up on adrenaline, but I ended up passing out within a few minutes of lying down on the super comfy bed. I had poured a rum thinking it would help me sleep, and I woke up the next morning with that same rum sitting beside the bed. I'm sorry Sailor Jerry, your help was not needed last night. Here we are. Day two in Lac Bonnie. In the hotel room here, just grabbing batteries and getting everything ready to go. It was a late night last night, and we finished filming at like one. So, back to town, back to Bozier by like two, and up and getting ready to go. As you can see I'm just getting batteries ready to go, putting things back in the panniers. Yep. Back onto the 44 to Seddon's corner and up to 214 I went, seeing a ton of bikes on the road again today, same as yesterday which was awesome. Plus the weekend was perfect for riding, gorgeous weather and no chance for rain, I love it. Back in town, my first stop was the farmer's market. The market goes all weekend long and is jammed full of great food, knickknacks, plants and everything you'd normally expect from one of these things. It's always surprising but awesome to check out the variety of items people have for sale. And I really enjoy that there are so many people out there being creative and hopefully making a living selling things that they've created with their own two hands. I love it. One of the things about riding a motorcycle is that space is at a premium. So your wallet doesn't take a massive hit visiting places like this, or at least not as big as a hit as it would had I have driven a car. I still managed to find some fresh fudge that I couldn't resist testing but I didn't try to load a bunch of random craft items into my top bag, like Homer Lusk Collier, except with home painted signs instead of thousands of old newspapers and like 12 broken pianos. Also, I've never created garbage booby traps that have inadvertently killed a sibling, unlike Homer. After checking out the farmer's market, I ambled over to the car show for a quick look around. Lactabani has a thriving classic and custom car club, and there were some real works of art to check out, including a DeLorean, a sweet school bus, an old international pickup, and several other vehicles, all of which had me wishing for a huge workshop to start a new project. Okay, multiple projects. Who am I kidding? 1973 Triumph Bonneville, 1967 Microbus Split Window, and 1995 BMW R1100 GS, I'm looking at you three to start. After exploring the car show, I headed over to the talent show to check out some locals getting down with their bad selves and playing some music in an open house, open night sort of formula. I have so much to say about open mics and jam nights and very little of it is good after years and years of touring and being forced by pain of death or so it would seem to be part of the house band. Afternoon jams were always the worst. It didn't matter if I was playing in Inovic or Swift Current or anywhere in between. There'd always be that one drunk guy that thought he was God's gift to the acoustic guitar 
who would stumble his way on stage and start mangling and screeching his way through House of the Rising Sun, or even worse, Sweet Home Alabama. While the audience cringed, the band subtly tried to commit suicide behind him, and the sound guy walked out. So I was apprehensive when I walked into the hall. Not because I was playing, which I wasn't, but because I didn't want to see Sweet Home Alabama guy in Lacked Bonnie. And I certainly didn't want to watch the souls of the rest of the musicians on stage die before my very eyes when the guy stepped up to the mic. All I can say is thank God because none of those things happened. What did happen was a great community jam session. It was awesome to see people get up on stage in front of the audience and give it their all, and it sounded great. I'm all there for these kinds of events, as it gives people a platform to learn how to play live in front of an audience, and it's a great opportunity for local players to connect. There were a ton of great musicians at this talent show, but one of my favorite moments was when the president of the Lactabonny Lions Club, Joel Spearman, stopped running around doing a thousand other jobs to ensure the show went off, including at one point cooking, I believe, to throw on his shades, grab his harp, and lay into a couple of solos with the band. It did my cynical, shitty music snob heart good to see it, and next time a talent show is on the itinerary, I won't hesitate to check it out. Finally, like a complete dumbass, I didn't check my camera settings and shot the whole thing in slow motion. So I have no audio, but I did get some great slow-mo shots of the musicians, as you can see. the show, it was time to jump back on the bike and head to my final destination for the weekend, Old Pinawa Dam. Old Pinawa Dam is an easy ride from Lac Bonnie. Simply head north on the 502 to the 313, then east and over the Winnipeg River Bridge, or the Skinny Bridge as the locals call it, to the 520, and south down the gravel into Pinawa Dam Provincial Heritage Park and the dam itself. Located on the Winnipeg River, Pinawa Dam was Manitoba's first hydroelectric generating station. Pinawa Dam was developed in response to the demand for residential and commercial power and was crucial to the rapid growth of Winnipeg in the pre-war years. The station began delivering power in 1906 and was closed in 1951 to allow the full flow of the Winnipeg River to serve the Seven Sisters Hydro Station built downstream. Seventy-one or so years after being shut down, the dam is now a heritage site, and it's a really beautiful, if not somewhat foreboding place to spend some time exploring. In the last episode, I suggested that it has kind of a post-apocalyptic vibe to it. And as you look at the crumbling concrete and rusting hulks of machinery around the site, it's not hard to imagine what a city would look like after a world-ending event, like a plague or the fallout from the Toronto Maple Leafs winning a Stanley Cup. I had the opportunity to speak with Lac Bonnie and District Historical Society President Terry Toddle about the history of the dam, and he shared a slice of the past that you don't get by reading a plaque on a wall. So once again, thank you for sharing, Terry. When did the generating station start? So, you know, as the, as the trapping uh, uh, faded or waned, I guess, then uh, City Winnipeg uh, was formed and other cities uh, in the east were getting hydroelectric power. So a number of uh, engineers' reports crossed the, uh, the mayor's desk in Winnipeg saying that the Winnipeg River was only 60 miles away and it would be a, there's six or seven rapids there would be good for, to harness power for the city of Winnipeg and of course the city you know didn't jump at it and I uh, had no power to, to do that really and uh, it was the uh, private enterprise of uh, these two fellows being uh, Mackenzie and Mann uh, who were railway contractors and had uh, uh, built a generating station I believe on the Niagara River uh, in eastern Canada so they had the uh, yeah, they, had the, they could roll the bank to uh, borrow three million bucks and uh, and uh, when they didn't have power and had quite a population it was booming so so on their their dime they built the, the generating station uh, in 1903 and uh, it uh, powered up in 1906 and uh, their first customer was the OB uh, uh, flour mill on Higgins Avenue so that was their first uh, commercial customer and uh, they could charge whatever they wanted because they had a monopoly. Right. And uh, the, after that, the city of Winnipeg said, no, nothing. <laughs> we've got to go into business. So then they, um, in 1909, they built uh, uh, Point Dubois, so the city, city of Winnipeg power. And with the competition, then uh, Winnipeg Electric Railway Company had to lower their rates. And then there was, uh, we had the cheapest power for 50 years. Uh, 
until the contract <laughs> was over and it goes up every every six months now eh? so um so building the generating station so they, they uh, the the pinawa generating station they put ads in the paper um they couldn't really acquire people from Winnipeg because they could get this whatever they were going to pay in out here for for labor uh they people would rather stay in the city so this brought out um immigrants to this area and uh so a lot of Swedes and Scandinavian, well, Scandinavians and Eastern Europeans would, would trickle out to uh, to apply for work and to get jobs, and it, they loved the area so much because it was so much like their home country that uh, uh, they took out homesteads and uh, and and stayed here. Like they they couldn't uh, make a living on the homesteads really; they had to work out on the railway or other generating stations. But they uh, um, they, they, they loved it here. Twenty-seven different. Right? Founding nationalities, yeah, 26, 27 yeah. founding nationalities, uh, like uh, you know, like Eastern Europeans are, and uh, the one that stands out is like most communities are Ukrainian or French, <coughs> but to have 27, and uh, one one of them is Latvians, and uh, there's no other. We had the largest Latvian population uh, west of Toronto um, prior to the First World War, and it's still still huge to, huge to this day. <coughs> oh, that's that's really interesting. Like Os Osis Lumber and uh, Dance It's Foods, uh, Usakis Contracting, they're all Latvian names. They have still in business in the third, fourth generations. Oh, that's so cool. After a couple hours spent at the dam, it was time to head home. I headed back up the 520 to the 313, then over to Drifters on the 11 to fill up with fuel. Once filled, I nosed south on the 11 and followed it all the way back to Elma, and then down the 15 back to Winnipeg. Once again, the 15 is a great ride. Although it was still very hot out, and after a couple of very long days in the sun, I was pretty fried so I pulled over for a short break in Enola before slabbing the last few kilometers back to Winnipeg and home. Hit the point where I needed a break because started to get that little bit of tunnel vision. It's been a long weekend, eh? Only 20 kilometers out of Winnipeg now, so I'll be home in a, home in a half an hour or so. Give or take a few minutes, depends on how bad this traffic gets. And it could get bad because apparently I was the only one that thought the 15 was a good choice. I don't know if it ever looks as good on camera. I don't know what you guys, I don't know if you guys will be able to hear me right now. But look at that, that's freaking spectacular. Wow. Well friends, that does it for part two of my Canada Day extravaganza in Lactabani. It was a busy yet super fun weekend and I sincerely hope you enjoyed tagging along with me. If you did, please take a moment to hit the like button and then subscribe to the channel and press that little bell button while you're there so you don't miss out on the next episode. Speaking of next episodes, my buddy Tyler and I decided to do an absolute marathon ride from Lactabani all the way to Duck Mountain Provincial Park for a weekend at the Blue Lakes Campground. Stay tuned for that, and stay tuned to watch Tyler swim, me cook bacon, and both of us almost expire from heat stroke several times while riding over 100 kilometers of gravel and sand. Until then, remember to explore often and explore local. Peace.